Now we'll do a scripture reading. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom and the glory of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, wait for it with patience. This is the word of the this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Charles. And that was Romans eight, eighteen through twenty five. So we're going to call this, uh, this sermon something like hoping and groaning our way to glory. <laughs> but if you think about our summary of, of this whole Romans series, it, it begins with saying humanity is more lost and God is more merciful. Believers, the believer's future is more glorious than most of us have ever imagined. And Starting last week and with this week also, we are beginning to imagine our glorious future. So I want us to kind of get in touch with our inner child to do this. So let me show a picture of a child here. Is, is this me when I was six years old? What do y'all think? I, no, it's not really. But, I, you know, when I look at my grandsons, you know, I, I kind of look at Kids that look like this, uh, except their beards are a lot shorter. But no, I want us to think about the wisdom that is in the heart of a child. When we are wise, we begin to see the consequences of our actions. For instance, on this math test uh, taken by someone named T.C. Hale, they were given this situation. Bob has 36 candy bars. He eats 29 of them. What does he have now? And the child says, diabetes. <laughs> Bob has diabetes. <laughs> now, that's a kid who understands consequences. <laughs> now, how many times were you asked as a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Now, we know that at this the way we respond to that question changes over time. This was a homework assignment in the form of a fill-in-the-blank uh, format. So it starts off, when I was three, I wanted to be a, and the child put in dad. When I was four, I wanted to be a toy designer. And uh, when I was five, I wanted to be a video game maker. So you see a progression here. He's considering more and more options. And now that I am not 55, when I'm 5.5, this kid knows that that's five and a half, I want to be a ninja chef when I grow up. So that's what he wants to be. And the teacher puts a little schedule out there so he can fill it out. And, that, and what he's saying is, you know, my work schedule is Monday through Thursday, I'm going to be a chef. I'm going to cook for people. On Friday, I'm going to be a ninja, and then I'm taking Saturday and Sunday off. So this guy's got it worked out. When I was in college, I did not have everything worked out. I remember wondering, who is going to give me a job? I tended to think not so much of my strengths as I did my weaknesses. 
and, and I wondered. All through my youth, I had wondered. There was a short time when I didn't mind being asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? Because for a while, that was really easy. I was going to be a professional basketball player. Why? Well, because I wasn't bad. I loved the game. And to be honest, it held out some hope of glory. Never apologize for the hope of glory. A lot of kids hope for glory, and they should. They hope that maybe they can become a beautiful princess or a great actor or a powerful soldier or superhero who saves the day or a famous singer who moves people deeply. Glory, for me, was helping my team win with an extraordinary performance and especially a last-second fabulous shot with a crowd going wild. This kind of hope was very real to me when I was young. And it does not go entirely away. Now, I've sort of given up on basketball. That's been a long process. <laughs> but even among grown-ups and young ones, young people, I want you to realize this. And grown-ups, I want you to be honest. Even among grown-ups, no matter how old we are, there is more that most of us would like to be and do. Often much more. None of us would mind glory. But what we really want is significance. To know that we're making a difference. That our lives are important. Now, in our reading from Romans 8, Paul is saying that there's much more to our lives than we may have suspected. Much more for those who are in Christ, whose lives are in His life. There's actually honest-to-goodness glory. But it's not a glory that's centered on us. The glory belongs to Christ. He begins, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul suffered more in his life than most people ever do. But he says that the glory that's going to be revealed to us is going to be f worth far more, way far more, than all the suffering that we can accumulate. And then he leaps to this rather surprising assertion. He brings in Creation itself, verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And last week we talked about the sonship of God. And the question for me is why? Why does creation wait with eager longing for the revealing of those who are adopted into sonship with God? And there are three reasons. First, in sonship, we belong to God, but creation belongs to God, okay? In Genesis 1, we read that with his voice, he called it into being, and with that same voice, he said it was good. It's good. This is good. Secondly, because we were made in the image of God to rule his creation. That's a second reason creation waits with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. God created humanity in his image, and he called us to be not just good, but very good, because we, like him, could be faithful servants and rulers if we worked with him. We could be. That was our calling. And Paul clearly had these accounts in mind when he wrote Romans 8. Paul also knew that Adam and Eve willfully defied God and turned their backs on their calling and on creation. It's so sad, but they really kind of spat 
on the trust God had given them. And they ruined with selfish desires the partnership for which they were created because they were going to be God's appointed rulers over creation. At this very moment, Paul says, creation is waiting. Waiting for humanity to resume its original and ordained role. The third reason creation waits with eager longing is because it bears a curse. In Genesis 3, 17 and 18, God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from, I said you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. In some, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden where everything had been perfect. And that was bad for them and for creation. In verse 20, Paul wrote, For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So, we messed up and creation suffered. It didn't even get a vote. You follow me? Okay. Let me take a step back and remind us of the world we live in and the kind of thinking we have here. There are many people who believe that there is no such thing as an all-good and all-powerful God. They reason that if God is a God of love, yet allows the pain and suffering that we see around us, He must be powerless to prevent it. And if God is powerful, if He is a God of supreme power, then He must not be a God of love, again, because of the suffering. So God is either good but not powerful, or he is all-powerful but not good. All this they reason is from the suffering that they see around them in the world. What's missing from this simplistic assessment is the reality and the effect of sin. Our sin, but also the accumulation of it down through the ages. You don't have to be a historian to see that any honest assessment of human history can illustrate how disastrously foolish and self-serving we can be. The truth is, when it comes to us, God not only tolerates suffering in His creation, He sometimes even ordains it for our discipline. But the problem is not that God lacks goodness. The problem all through the story, all through history, has been that we lack goodness. Can you own up to that? Can you see that as the problem with our race? The entrance of sin into the world plunged creation into ruin. A ruin that not only affects the animals of the earth, but the entire earth and the created order itself. Whenever the Bible rehearses the repercussions of the fall, the corruption of creation is laid at our doorstep, at humanity's doorstep. It was we who were powerful, but not good. This is the truthful story of the Scriptures, but it's not the whole story. Again, verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Hope that what? Hope that what? That the creation itself will be set free. Creation itself will be set free from what? From bondage into freedom. From the bondage to corruption to freedom. So, what am I trying to say? All right, a lot of words, right? Man's disobedience corrupted everything. You've ruined everything, God could have said. 
It hurt our relationship with God, and it corrupted our sense of responsibility to the creation, which fell into bondage. Now, let me share with you some examples of corruption and futility that I've seen. Okay? And and you've got your own. Uh, Let's think for a moment about pigeons, okay? We humans domesticated pigeons. They are nearly all over the world. Why? Because humans brought them there. And they were brought because they were more than pets. They carried messages for us. People raced them. They lived pampered lives as honored human companions for centuries and centuries and centuries. And then we got the postal system and telephones, and we threw them out the window like trash. And their species had become fully domesticated, so they could not survive in the wild. They lost all their survival instincts during the centuries that they lived caged up by people. And that's why now they live in cities with people instead of out in the woods somewhere. It's our fault. When we were in Europe, you know, you go to every uh, piazza, and what's there? Just pigeons, lots and lots of them. And people curse them as winged rats. But they're that way because they don't know how to live without us. And their instincts tell us that they should trust us. So they continue to hang out with humans, hoping we'll give them food, because that's the only survival skill they've got left. Except flying. That's an illustration of creation. A little part of it, subjected to futility. Let me give you another one. Years ago, Melanie and I got to take a marvelous trip. We visited some Galapagos Islands. Our guides told us about the laws that protect the marvelous ecosystems on each island and the waters around them. But one guide told us about a threat. Sophisticated Chinese fishing ships threatened the delicate delicately balanced ecosystems. How? Well, these large ships would work their way through the islands, catching thousands and thousands of sharks on huge trot lines, crank them in mechanically, and process them for their fins and oils and hides. It's illegal as it gets. But these ships are armed with weapons and technology, and there's no authority that's subduing them and prosecuting them. It's another example of creation being subjected to futility. I'm going to keep on going because I want to make this point. I spent a fair time hunting deer in South Texas when I was young. Once in a while, still do. In South Texas, well, everybody knows that everything there either scratches, sticks, bites, or stings. So nobody's there for the comfort, okay? Why do we go there? We go there to get away, to reconnect with nature and to be with family and occasionally harvest a good deer. One day, my extended family was in danger of being landlocked by a scornful neighbor and unable to bring in electricity, and we were finally ready for you know, high-tech stuff. The solution was found for us in deeding our little ranch to the big one next to us. And in turn, they bought us a different little ranch nearby that wasn't in danger of being landlocked. Now, these big ranch owners were extremely wealthy, and they wanted their clients and their guests to easily bag big bucks trophies. In order to ensure that, they needed a different gene pool for their deer. And so they took our little ranch, they put high fences all around that ranch, which was now theirs, and they, they eradicated the entire herd. When I heard about it, I could not speak. I was so angry. But what was done was done. 
and my anger was futile. But ever since the fall of man, men have turned the privilege of stewarding creation into opportunities to exploit it, to serve our pride, our greed, or power. Back in Paul's time, the Roman army would sometimes burn land, and then they would salt it so that it could not ever produce again. It's horrible. Empire after empire, dynasty after dynasty, fallen man after fallen man. Look at what we do. The next time we feel like getting angry with God and, and shaking our fists in his face and asking, why do you allow this? The real questions should be, why do we allow what we allow? And why should God ever again entrust people like us with the responsibility of helping him put things right? And yet, that's exactly what he wants to do. When I was young, I heard people say, well, what happens to plants and animals doesn't really matter. They don't have souls. And I would think, who is it without a soul? Listen, this is important. God really loves his creation. And he loves us. And it's part of God's dream to have his kids graciously and wisely rule over his creation with him. Do you remember last week's message when, when a Roman citizen adopted a non-citizen or a slave? This is what happened. He paid that person's debts. He gave him his name. And he made him an heir. And then he charged him to uphold the honor and the responsibilities of the family with his inheritance. That's Roman adoption, and that's what the Romans who read Paul's letter understood about it. But God's adoption does the same thing, and it sets us up for our vocation as gracious rulers of creation to be restored. Look at the second part of verse 21. The purpose is so that Creation will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, I know that that's vague. But it's also true. And I want us to begin meditating on that. Verse 22 says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And verse 23 says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. So, creation groans under the curse and longs for a new beginning. We groan as well if we are children of God. When we encounter deep human suffering and we want to pray just as deeply, what do we do in prayer? Sometimes we just weep and cry and just implore our Lord, have mercy, have mercy. And if we love what, God's, what God loves, we also groan over creation's mismanagement. Sometimes we groan because we feel helpless. Like we'd love to be able to do something, but we're just not able yet to fully live into our calling as God's children and co-rulers. But what Paul is telling us, and what I want you to believe today, is that when Jesus reappears, things are going to be different. Perhaps not instantly be different, but they will become different because he will be seen by the world as he is. And his honest-to-goodness followers are going to have jobs, beautiful, important, impactful jobs to do. In the meantime, as we await him, 
we also have jobs to devoutly and devotedly represent him. To say he's the king and we proclaim his kingdom. And to pray whenever we come across people who are hurting. And sometimes even to pray on behalf of a cursed land and mistreated creatures. It's part of being human, folks. So, our adoption has an already and a not yet dimension. Where have we heard that before? The kingdom of God has an already and a not yet dimension. But the good news is that full adoption is coming. The full redemption is coming. And it's promised by the one who always keeps his promises. Now, everyone, including me, wants to know what exactly that's going to look like. If Paul knows, he's not telling. In verses 24 and 25, he says, Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. In other words, Paul's not trying to describe exactly how it's going to happen. He just wants us to know. It's going to happen. I've got two daughters, two beautiful daughters who are very pregnant. <laughs> they are waiting with hope and with impressive degrees of patience. They don't know what their children are going to look like, the ones that are going to come. They don't know what those children are going to be like. But they do know that each child will be forever a vital part of their lives from the very moment that mommy's hollering is over. Yes, there will be labor pains, but that's just part of it. And the minute the baby is born, what happens? The pain's forgotten, right? It's true. It's miraculous. The miracle of life and the miracle of motherhood take over, and mom resumes her powerful calling That's what it's going to be like for us when our bodies are completely redeemed and we get to get on with the great vocation that our Father had in mind for, for us from the very beginning. As we prepare to wrap this up, I want you to just take a step back with me because we've been teaching on Romans for a long time. And I want you to realize that throughout the letter of Romans is the great work and works of redemption. First, God redeems our sinful nature and adopts us. Secondly, He will redeem our bodies. And then, He will redeem our vocations and put us to work in an exciting new creation. That's what He says. That's what He promises. Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. So the Bible tells us a new day is coming with a new heaven and a new earth and creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into a beautiful peace and we as co-heirs with Christ will take our place as stewards over creation. If we take Romans 8 seriously, we who are his adopted heirs are going to live forever and we're actually going to have great stuff to do. I, for one, am excited and relieved that we won't just be plucking harps and popping bonbons. <laughs> what we're going to do is going to matter. I love the way Tim Keller put this. He said, there's a glory coming that will be so blindingly powerful that when it falls upon us, it will envelop the whole created order and glorify it along with us. And we, we will bring nature with us into a renewed, restored, redeemed reality. I really like that. Oh my gosh. Don't you just feel sorry for people who don't have that vision that you and I have now? Life's only going to get better, folks. How many people here have read the Chronicles of Narnia? Okay, uh, by C.S. Lewis, children's books. 
Everyone really should, young and old. These are great stories about British children and a world that they discover by magic that often falls into evil times. In the Chronicles of Narnia, the only time that Narnia has peace is when the four thrones at Caer Paravel are occupied by true sons of Adam and daughters of Eve who will rule on behalf of Aslan, the great lion himself, the king of kings and the son of the great emperor over the sea. They're great fictional stories, but what makes them great is not the words, but the truth within them, because the story is really about us. It's about us and the thrones that God has prepared for us to occupy beneath his throne. Remember that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Almost nobody says, I don't care what it is, I just want to be glorious. But maybe we should. In Christ's glory, by being faithful to him, we can all, all, all of us have a glorious future. And for now... We're just beginning to learn what it means to live as children of God. But we are here on earth amidst a broken creation in a season to learn. And that's why we just need to be determined to practice the kind of stuff that makes for a good steward and ruler over creation. Just wait, we cry to a groaning creation. It's coming. He's coming, and so are we, the redeemed, the adopted daughters and sons of God. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let me invite our musicians to come up and ministers at this time. Don't ever think that you're alone in thinking about your future. God thinks about your future all the time, but he doesn't worry about it. He just, he just abides in it, and he sees what by grace and through the power of redemption in his Holy Spirit you're going to be. And he asks you to trust in him. Let him work with you. Let him call you into a beautiful future. Let him fill you with courage. Let him make you into the kind of person that makes a difference, who doesn't want to contribute to the sadness of this world, but be the kind of person who will change it for the good and for the glory of God. People, the prayer ministers are in this place. You are invited to come forward with any need, concern, or hope that you have that you want someone to pray with you about. Amen.